Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the UC Irvine Division of Continuing Education. Uh, welcome. We are so excited that you're here today. My name is Kathy Tam, and I handle uh, marketing and engagement for our team here in corporate education. Um, we're going to get started here in a few minutes, but before we do that, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping items so that you know what to expect today. Um, as always, our webinars are recorded. Closed captioning is available. Um, during this webinar, uh, Dr. Groves is going to ask us for quite a bit of interaction today. So I'm going to be encouraging you along the way to use the chat window. Um, just make sure that your chats that uh, you want to post, you select everybody so that the whole group can view it. And there will be a section too where I'm going to ask you to raise your hands and we can open you up so that the whole crowd can hear you over your microphone. And we're also going to be launching two polls that we'll ask you to respond to. And then we'll do two separate Q&As this afternoon, one after Dr. Groves is done presenting, and then one after Missy Pittman, our director of corporate education, is done presenting. So hopefully that sounds OK for everybody. For those of you that are new to the university, uh, we are part of our larger campus, the University of California, Irvine. Um, we are part of the 10 campus UC system here on our campus. We're uh, the second largest employer in Orange County. We've got three Nobel prizes um, and we're ranked eighth among best public universities in the US. And if you're new to us at the Division of Continuing Education, we are the division of the university that um, helps career professionals with continuing education in the form of certificate programs or courses that are very uh, practical and lend knowledge to the job at hand, the career that you're in um, now or a career that you're looking to pursue. So all of our uh, certificate programs and courses, we've got over 80 right now. They're very practical. They're all industry applicable training. All of our instructors are in industry, depending on what the industry is. Um, almost all of our classes are available online and in virtual formats with synchronous sessions with instructors. And the best part about our curriculum is it's all accredited and UC approved. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about what we do specifically here in corporate education. Um, we do two separate things. In corporate education, we're actually really known best for our talent development side, where we come into organizations that have large groups that would like to be trained on a specific subject matter. Uh, that could be leadership or project management. Uh, so we are able to deliver those exclusive, exclusively to corporations uh, here locally and around the country. Um, if you have smaller groups of uh, staff that are looking to be trained, I'm going to drop down to point number three. We have something called a cor corporate consortium. So a consortium works uh, on a level like we're going to talk about today with you, like our global leadership program, where you can have one or two or even a few more of your staff members come sit in a program, but you're learning and you're sharing knowledge with people that are like-minded, but from different industries. So it's a super great experience. And then we also offer something else called enterprise partnership. So for corporations that don't need to train their staff specifically and have a, a training need internally, you can partner with us at the Division of Continuing Education through a partnership program that we call enterprise partnership. And what that does, it's a no cost upfront program uh, for companies where their staff then gets 15% off all of our certificate programs and courses. So it's a really awesome way to get involved in what we're doing here on the continuing education side at UCI. And then we are, uh, it's not completely new, but we are launching our talent acquisition side. So for our current students, part of our talent acquisition piece is called the Career Advancement Network. So we help um, students and company that are here learning with us and then also pursuing their dreams at their corporation, we can help them uh, kind of move up the ladder or uh, switch fields, see what they want to do with the next step of their uh, their pursuits in their career. And we have a career educator here on staff that's fantastic. Uh, for employers that want to engage with us to recruit our learners, who are all, again, professionals, we have a 1220 job board that you can participate in. And then we also have learners that would love to be non-paid internship interns at your corporations. So we have all those opportunities available and I will be reaching out after the webinar so that you have my contact information if any of this information uh, is pertinent to you and what's happening at your organization. But without further ado, I'm actually going to stop sharing 
And I am going to introduce Kevin so that he can get started with what you all came here for today. All right, Kevin, it looks like you're starting to share your screen here. We see it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, All appreciate, right. appreciate the handoff. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Welcome all. So nice to see you and hopefully uh, hear from you in just a moment. Um, as Kathy nicely introduced, um, this session is intended to be interactive. Um, absolutely want to invite your voice into a part of the conversation we're going to have today around cultural intelligence and specifically uh, CQ or cultural intelligence capabilities for those in, in leadership roles, those uh, uh, across your organizations uh, and uh, for many of you, hopefully a part of your own uh, learning and development, leadership development uh, journey. Um, session outline today, uh, I would like to introduce a little bit of you know, where these, these capabilities, uh, the idea of, of how and why leaders should develop in these ways, where it came from. Um, uh, and then introduce uh, the Global Leadership Program, uh, which is, uh, Kathy referenced, is a, a part of the program offering um, to learners who are, are looking uh, both uh, as a part of teams, as a part of organizations, or really anywhere in your career journey, uh, developing global leadership capabilities that is important to you. Uh, ample opportunity for questions, uh, Q&A session, both on the program and specific to our, uh, our conversation today. So first and foremost, excited to be with you all and thank you for being making this a part of your, your afternoon. All right, a little bit on introduction. I did want to share just uh, briefly on my background. Um, I have the, the uh, pleasure of, of wearing a, a several hats. Um, uh, uh, first and foremost, I uh, have the opportunity to be engaged in talent development leadership development, succession planning, and other practices um, in the context of um, a boutique consulting firm. Uh, most of the work that we do is helping organizations design custom leadership assessments, uh, succession, and other talent development programming. Uh, we do this primarily through 360 multi-source and other assessment tools, uh, in addition to helping leadership teams and executive teams navigate uh, strategic transitions. Uh, a lot of that work is around helping facilitate strategic planning um, sessions and decision making that that leadership teams face. Um, I also have the privilege of serving as professor of management at Pepperdine Grazio Business School. Uh, I've been a, a tenured faculty member there for 15 years uh, and primarily teach in our executive programs uh, uh, in the areas of organization design, strategic alignment and leadership uh, talent management capabilities is uh, largely my role. Um, uh, privileged to be with you, you here today, in large part to focus on one critically important leadership capability, competency that we know uh, perhaps has always been important, but even more so important in today's context. And um, again, we'd like to invite you into a conversation today around you know, what are we starting to learn about cross-cultural or culturally intelligent skill sets for those in leadership roles, those who execute leadership influence, and you all do, irrespective of your position in your organization, you, you absolutely have that influence, and how can we get better at it? What are we learning about how to further develop these capabilities? Um, so uh, very quickly on our uh, webinar preview, uh, I'd like to first just describe and have a discussion around um, what is cultural intelligence? What are these four capabilities and why do they matter? You know, what is the, the kind of pressing business case? And perhaps as importantly, your own career development leadership journey case for, for why perhaps this is an important part of your own growth and learning. Um, two, I uh, wanted to walk you through uh, an experience of how might, how do leaders develop Cultural, culturally intelligent skill sets or capabilities. Where does that come from? Uh, and uh, as long as you're all willing, would like to share a, a personal experience, uh, an expatriate experience that 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 uh, usually, when done uh, uh, well or at least done thoughtfully, can be an experience to develop these uh, these CQ skills. Uh, and then finally, I uh, wanted to close today with a conversation around the global leadership program itself and just talk through a bit of its structure, uh, the four uh, courses, the four topical areas, 
and some of the, the thinking around experiential learning and, and the actual learning and development uh, activities that are built into the program. And so we'll, we'll have a little bit of opportunity to talk through that, uh, that program as, uh, as needed. Okay, uh, so first and foremost, wanted to start, uh, I hope, the conversation where, where it really matters, and that is with all of you. So if I could ask you to, to go through a brief reflection um, just for the next uh, uh, minute or so, reflecting on the cross-cultural experiences of your, of your career. Uh, and I'd like you to think of a specific time that either you or someone that you observed, could be someone in a leadership role, could be a peer, could be a colleague, could be a friend or a spouse, but think about a specific time where you or someone you know experienced a setback a disappointment, uh, perhaps an experience that just didn't go as well as you had hoped, and it was largely due to perhaps not being able to effectively navigate across a cultural group. And this is really important to the, the cultural intelligence perspective, and that is think of cultural groups um, uh, not only by way of nationality, which I'll, I'll describe in a moment, but also group cultures. Uh, professional or occupational cultures, multiple generation, uh, generational cultures. Think of, of multiple forms of different groups and the, the assumptions and values that, that created the, a challenge in this experience that you're reflecting on. Um, so think of you know, what was this professional organizational context? Who were the stakeholders involved? Why was this important to you? What, what were the stakes as a part of this experience? How might greater or higher level of cross-cultural skills or cultural intelligence have changed this experience for the better. So again, if you're thinking of, of a person you observed or yourself, how might that have gone better if you had a chance to do it again? Uh, and then lastly, you know, consider the range of potential benefits uh, to you and to those involved. You know, if cross-cultural capability skills uh, perhaps was, uh, was heightened, meaning uh, what it may have turned out better for you, but also for for those those in the experience. Um, so, um, and we'll we'll kind of unlock this as we go through our conversation today. So, for the next uh, forty five minutes or so, if I could just ask you to keep this experience in mind, because it'll be important to our our conversation. So, what is the business case for cultural intelligence or navigating across different, new, or challenging cultural contexts, just broadly? Um, one acronym, one way of, of sort of thinking about this that I found is powerful is maybe the, the recognition that we are in a truly unprecedented uh, VUCA context, meaning the level of and the intensity of the volatility and changes happening in our world uh, is perhaps unprecedented in many ways. And it puts a unique sort of uh, expectations, emergent expectations on those in leadership roles as it relates to navigating the cross-cultural context. So here's one way to think of this. I, I like to, to think of this in terms of mega trends. If we were to kind of encapsulate the biggest drivers of how leadership expectations have shifted, um, you don't have to go too far to, to stumble on the you know, ubiquitous digital transformation um, that is essentially uh, transforming business services, products, uh, our world, both how organizations operate in addition to how we create value for um, our customers, our consumers, um, is, is, is radically transformed. So navigating a cross-cultural context absolutely accelerated by the digital transformation. Um, the workforce itself, the global workforce, if you just think of the, the colleagues and stakeholders uh, with whom you engage, both internally and externally, I would bet it's likely far more diverse with respect to demographic background than it was even five years ago, and certainly 20 years ago. So the, see, the idea of, of the globalized labor market and workforce is a big driver. Um, COVID-19, or perhaps uh, in more of a, of a, of a longer-term trend, the idea that we need leaders most and we need leadership most during times of crisis, during times of incredible uncertainty. And the global pandemic, one example of those, we go back 10 further years, we can think of the global economic uh, crisis as during sort of extreme uncertain events. You know, that's when we really need leaders who are able to navigate across, across groups, across cultural expectations. And then finally, 
um, almost a, as a parallel in part or, or a part of the digital transformation, um, the changing nature of what we ask of, of ourselves, of our colleagues and the work that we do and where we find meaning, the meaningfulness of the work that we do is, is, has been, will continue to be transformed by, uh, by digital transformation. And so from a leadership perspective, that becomes even more important. How are we creating an experience, a meaningful experience for ourselves and for those, those around us? Again, particularly from a leadership perspective. So these are, are, are just a, a one way to think of, of mega trends or these big drivers. So what's the influence? What's sort of the premium on? What does this mean for leaders and leadership development? You know, why might we, we kind of zero in on cultural capabilities? Uh, a few ways to think about this. One, um, if we know that these are powerful trends and they're likely to stay, then we have to get better at navigating across cultural context. Again, not just nationality, not, uh, not solely uh, by way of nationality, but also by way of generational shifts, uh, occupational, even thinking of public-private sort of partnerships, you know, partnerships with government agencies where often that requires having to navigate into a very different cultural context. And I'll bet we have a few folks on the call today who uh, can, can relate to that sort of, um, how do we work together in, in meaningful ways. Um, two, recognizing just the idea that you know, navigating across culture can be uh, agnostic to, to individual groups, meaning we're often asked to do a lot of this. For those of you who operate in uh, global matrix organizations, for example, you're intimately familiar with navigating across both regional, occupational, and um, often even uh, technological in terms of, of remote work. Uh, for example, uh, navigating multinational remote teams uh, puts a lot of pressure on having to navigate across groups. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, the tension that, that many leaders face, uh, we all face to some degree, how do we maintain authenticity about how we want to lead and engage others in our organizations? while simultaneously demonstrating behavioral flexibility, being adaptive and flexible to the cultural context and what it demands. That tension is, is very real. And um, I can share with you, I've, uh, you know, I work a lot with leadership teams and uh, executive groups, and that, that, that tension comes out in wanting to stay true to who you are, being authentic, while also recognizing I have to be adaptable, I have to lead and engage in different ways. So these, these are all uh, uh, part of the business case or the driver around why cultural intelligence, why might that be a, an important part of, you know, part of your growth and learning as you uh, navigate your own career. Okay, uh, last but not least, um, uh, I, I suspect, you know, as, as many of you are likely aware, uh, we're learning a lot more about how decision making and the sort of biases, both explicit and implicit biases that we all bring to decision making context. And we're learning even more about what leaders can do about it proactively. How do we create conditions where um, we limit, uh, we can't eliminate, but we can, we can limit the, the implicit unconscious biases uh, that we bring and we create conditions where uh, we can at least minimize those so that the influence that you all have in a leadership context is really important in this, in this uh, as we think about uh, the value of cultural intelligence. Okay, here's just one snapshot. Um, and this is a, a, a kind of give you a taste of the global leadership uh, program. And that is to think, well, what do we know about cultural differences and leadership style? And if we just take one dimension, understanding attitudes toward authority and decision-making uh, preferences as it relates to nationality or national culture. Uh, this is um, a, a known, a well-known scholar, um, uh, Aaron Meyer, has done fantastic work by examining, well, we know there tends to be a preferred uh, way to go about leading and engaging teams uh, in different parts of the world, if we just just use nationality as one input, and, and you see illustrated here the extent to which consensual decision making uh, uh, and the idea of hierarchical versus more egalitarian assumptions, you know, how many team members are expected to have a voice, you know, when decisions are made. Um, and this just provides one input, one part of what we'll, we'll touch on in a moment, in a moment 
uh, CQ knowledge, cultural intelligence knowledge. What do we know as professionals about the nationality or national context in which we're embedded? Um, as you see here uh, in a, a Western US uh, based uh, approach, we're likely uh, uh, familiar with preferences for a bit more top down and heavy egalitarian expectations. How do we engage a team member? So this is just one, one input. Another, another way to think of the business case is around, well, if we know uh, we're learning more about the unconscious biases that we all bring, uh, unbeknownst to us, of course, to decision making, how can we get better at it? How can we limit this from impacting our own decisions and the decision making environment that we cultivate with our teams? And so one way to think of this is what is the role of cultural intelligence? to try to minimize, mitigate, or in some way uh, limit as much as possible uh, the, the sources of unconscious bias that we bring to, to context. Um, and, and one really important contribution, and, and many of you might be familiar with this work, is around, we know a lot about how we make decisions. The automatic kind of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the quick decision making that we make in terms of decision making, uh, and, and the processing information versus uh, uh, decision making that's a bit more methodical. And so if you're familiar with this work around uh, thinking fast and slow, you know, very noted uh, economist, behavioral economist, Daniel Kahneman, uh, did a lot of work around this idea of system one versus system two thinking. Um, and essentially, uh, the, the short of it is uh, we, we as, organ as leaders, certainly those in complex organizations, um, tend to have to do a lot of system one thinking, very unconscious, automatic. We have so much information and data at our disposal. Um, uh, in, in many ways, we have to chunk and make, uh, um, uh, make accessible information that we can make fast decisions. The challenge there is it, it, it does lead us into some cases, the trap of unconscious bias, right? It leads us more susceptible uh, to, to introducing some of these biases in our decisions. Um, so how do we slow down? How do we, how do we essentially uh, allow ourselves more of a, of a methodical, rational thinking as needed? Um, a lot of the research, uh, I've had the pleasure of being involved in these projects over the years, um, leaders and team members who do develop strong cultural intelligence capabilities uh, tend to essentially limit and that is, it, it allows us to engage in more of the, the rational um, thinking and conscious, deliberate uh, thinking and decision making, as opposed to more of the, the, the automated, the automatic. And so, again, think of the, the part of the business case here for these CQ intelligence, uh, uh, cultural intelligence capabilities is limiting these biases that, that we make in decisions. Um, so, what is it? What is cultural intelligence? Um, a couple of, of uh, well, one, one context I'd like to share with you um, is, is the, again, this definition that is, is agnostic to, to the cultural group. So it very purposely, essentially, is the capability to function effectively across multiple or varied cultural context, national, ethnic, organizational, group cultures, generational perspectives. Um, what do those skills look like? And the assumption is this is validated by research. Uh, these are skills that can be learned and developed. They're malleable. They do consist of a form of intelligence, meaning they're predictive of important outcomes in contexts that are culturally diverse. Meaning um, uh, if you think of all of the teams and organizations that you're a part of, to the extent that they are uh, culturally diverse, cultural intelligence is, is likely to predict uh, outcomes of interest. And I'll, I'll share those in just a, just a moment. So um, why now? What is it about our VUCA environment that would suggest CQ is important? Um, you know, this movement, this way of thinking um, has been around uh, for 20 years or so. So it's gone through the rigorous research validation process. And again, I'm happy to share more with you if you're interested. I've had the, the pleasure of being involved in several of those projects to help validate what do we know about cultural intelligence. The research itself suggests, again, if you're a part of a culturally, um, a culturally diverse team, organization, or context, we know that leaders who have high CQ tend to have much better uh, adjustment and adaptability 
Think of expats, expatriate adjustment in different contexts. Um, improve judgment, decision making, negotiation effectiveness, particularly negotiating with colleagues uh, who, are, who are in an unfamiliar, or at least unfamiliar to you, cultural context. Um, leadership performance, the ability to cultivate innovative outcomes, um, research and development uh, teams. Um, so the, the, the research is really uh, profound and it's been used in multiple contexts. And um, this is just an example, uh, Google, uh, Pricewaterhouse, Harvard, um, uh, literally thousands of organizations have um, tried to adopt at least a part of this, uh, this perspective and how should we be developing our team for this, uh, this new workforce. Okay. Um, so here's where I'd like to share an example with you, and then we're going to transition to, uh, to a poll, and that is, what are these capabilities? What do they look like? And uh, I'm going to uh, disclose in a moment here a personal experience that, that I hope you'll appreciate, and how, how, uh, how are these uh, capabilities actually developed through an expat experience? And so the, the four capabilities are drive, knowledge, strategy, and action. And the drive is essentially this, this sort of intrinsic level of interest, confidence, or self-efficacy to adapt to a cultural context that is unfamiliar to you, that feels different or might, might feel challenging. So again, think of the, the experience that I asked you to reflect on when we started today, a context that was particularly challenging. Knowledge, what is the data and information that you bring into the context that you, you try to kind of arm yourself with. Uh, again, the expat experience is a common one. How much do I know about this new world, this new context, this new region that I'm, I'm operating? You know, do I have any information, data, perspectives to draw from? This one's really important. Level of awareness and ability to plan for, meaning you have a sort of a, a loose set of expectations that you're looking to, 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 to be very thoughtful about Here's how I'm going to approach this negotiation with a colleague who perhaps has a very different worldview, different set of assumptions, um, but, but I'm going to very carefully use that as a sort of loose strategy, and I'm willing to change those assumptions as I engage with, uh, with this colleague in a, in a negotiation context. And then finally, CQ action, how agile, how adaptable, how well do we demonstrate behavioral flexibility? Are we really able to, to navigate in a way and, and engage people differently? And that's often things like communication skills, nonverbal behaviors, um, the ability to, to adapt to um, uh, cultural customs that might, may be uncomfortable. Uh, these are uh, important skill sets. And what I'd like to do, if you're okay with it, is a little bit of self-disclosure and in some ways, uh, uh, kind of a vulnerability, and that is um, uh, my own expatriate experience. And so just very briefly, if I could share, um, what do these CQ capabilities look like in, in practice? Often it is a, a cultural experience that forces us to navigate something new, something unfamiliar. Um, so I'm gonna walk through each of the four capabilities in just a moment through the lens of my own uh, experience. Uh, I had the, the, the absolute pleasure and honor of serving as a uh, Fulbright uh, Scholar, the U.S. Scholar Program essentially exports uh, American scholars to universities all over the world, usually for six-month uh, intensive experiences. Um, I was blessed to have an experience at uh, MCI uh, Management Center, uh, which is in Innsbruck, Austria, as a part of their Family Business Center. Um, I study and do a lot of work with uh, companies in the area of succession planning. Uh, and this was a, a fantastic opportunity to spend six months in a part of the world I, I had never experienced. And so this certainly represented a, a sense of, of, um, of, of newness uh, to me. As you see illustrated here, uh, these are uh, German, Austrian, and Croatian uh, colleagues uh, that were a part of the Family Business Center that I continue to, uh, to collaborate in various projects. Um, so here's, uh, for those who have visited, uh, this is the, uh, the beauty of Innsbruck, Austria. Uh, capital of Tyrol. Um, you'll see the Inn River here on the left, uh, the downtown. Uh, this is uh, 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 Maria Theresa Strasse. This is their main um, kind of gathering place in Old Town. Uh, then, of course, uh, you see the Alps uh, lower left. Uh, that is uh, Bergisel. That is the, the ski jump. Uh, Innsbruck was home to uh, two Winter Olympics in the uh, 60s and 70s. And then um, on the bottom right there is the Nordketa. That's their famous uh, gondola system um, that uh, is on the North Mountain Range toward Germany. 
Um, so why do I share this with you? Why, why might this be one, one window into development of cultural intelligence capabilities? Um, this is an aerial view uh, looking to the north here. This is uh, towards, uh, toward Germany, uh, aerial view of, of Innsbruck. So I, I'd like to walk through this. Um, I'm, I'm about to, we're about to release a, a poll in just a moment. So um, as I share with you my experience in developing these capabilities, if I could ask you just to reflect on for you, you know, what might be a, an area of strength, what might be a development opportunity as you think of, of each of these. Um, so as I think of my own experience, a, a big part of CQ Drive is what is the level of intrinsic interest and self-efficacy or confidence to be able to successfully complete, in this case, a six-month expatriate experience. Um, so that's the starting point for CQ Drive. Is there a clear sense of the value of this international global experience, both in, in terms of relationships uh, with, with people and, and colleagues, a partnership with the local university, and, and quite clearly in my case, and I'll share with you a few photos, a family experience. Uh, my wife and uh, two children uh, were a part of this uh, six month journey. And so it was very much a part of the, the, the value, intrinsic value of, of this assignment, this experience. Uh, CQ knowledge, uh, uh, frankly, not walking in cold and, and having a real sense of, well, what, how might I better understand the Austrian culture, uh, Germanic cultures more broadly, uh, the region of Tyrol uh, as a mountaineering town, largely uh, a, a big influence there in tourism, clearly, uh, but even within the Austrian economy, the role that, uh, that Tyrol plays in, in the context, really important. And a part of that, some of the professional leadership expectations uh, uh, in a international university as an American scholar uh, was, was important to understand. Uh, this one's important, uh, CQ strategy, uh, uh, the sort of planning and being aware of how am I going to engage, develop the right relationships uh, with uh, colleagues, uh, with administrative members, the rector at MCI, uh, which is a dean, um, as well as um, being really careful, and this, this is critical to the CQ perspective, and that is not making the assumptions of stereotyping that everything you think you know, or in this case me, about here's what I should expect from my Austrian colleagues or others in this context, um, to ensure that I'm, you're checking, I'm checking assumptions, and that is willing to revise assumptions as you engage with those, not assuming that these national values that Hofstede dimensions and other models would, would, would tell us um, uh, essentially dictates how, how I, would, I would interact in this context. So checking assumptions you make that might be well-intentioned. For example, the Fulbright program does a, a fantastic job of preparing scholars for the context in which they're about to embark, um, but that ha those have to be loosely held assumptions. You want to meet people where they are, and that becomes really important. And then finally, uh, CQ action is, is all about behavioral um, uh, adaptability, behavioral flexibility. Um, how well uh, are you able to recognize differences in communication, in uh, phys physical uh, gestures, and in terms of uh, not just in the professional context, but uh, more uh, um, as a member of the community? Um, these were all, all important. Uh, if we had more time, I'm happy to share uh, more, more experiences that were uh, learning experiences for me and my family, but we'll uh, uh, move on to, uh, to our conversation here. So um, here's how the story began. Uh, this was our arrival uh, on February 8th, 2022. Uh, you might recall two weeks later, uh, the war, uh, the Russian invasion and, and war in Ukraine broke out. So it was a particularly um, uh, uh, heightened uh, awareness in terms of the, the region that we were a part of. Um, here's the uh, River Inn, again, uh, the centerpiece of, uh, of, of Innsbruck, uh, looking to the north, uh, and a little bit with the, with the Alps in the, in the spring. So we were very, very grateful for that experience. And then finally, uh, our six-month adventure ended um, uh, in July, so about a, a six-month expat experience. Okay, let's get back to all of you. Uh, poll question. I'd like to share with you uh, two, uh, two questions here, and um, uh, Kathy is going to bring up the poll in just a moment. Um, first, what would you describe as, uh, now that you have a little bit of context around these four capabilities, what would you describe as your greatest strength 
uh, uh, perhaps something that you've leveraged in the past or plan to leverage in, in the future in the cultural context that you're a part of. And then two, what would you describe as perhaps a, an area of development? Uh, maybe it's something a part of a development plan or something that you're, you're, you've, you've been working on, it's important to you. you know, what might be an area you wanna further develop uh, if you're thinking of taking something from today's conversation? So let me, uh, let me give you a chance to, uh, to reflect on that a little bit and um, uh, we'll, we'll share the poll results in just a moment here once we've given everybody a chance to, uh, to mark, their, mark their choices. Yeah, Kevin, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. We have everybody here jumping in, uh, uh, looking at the poll for the greatest strength. I'm just going to leave this going here for a little bit more time. A um, couple more answers coming in. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end it so that everybody can see the um, results of that. And then Kevin, then I'll launch the next one. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and end the first one. Sharing results. Can everybody see that? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Looks great. Okay, now let's go ahead, Kevin, and I will get the next poll going here. Doesn't look like it's letting me launch that second poll, Kevin. Hi, right, Kathy. I uh. Did you launch it for me? Okay. Yeah, I, I did. Opportunity. I see it, everybody. Sorry, there. Technology got the best of me. We've got some results coming in right now. Let me just let this run here for a couple seconds, and then I'll end it so everybody can see the results. Wow, so many of you are engaging. We'd love this. Okay, we've got a lot going here on uh, QC strategy or CQ strategy. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. It looks like the majority of people have uh, answered. Let's share our results. Can everybody see the results? Kevin, can you see that? Yeah, looks great. Thank you, Kathy. So a couple important themes here. Thank you everyone for, uh, for chiming in. We're gonna get to some discussion in just a moment. Uh, top two strengths are clearly uh, drive uh, and uh, action, behavioral flexibility, and a clear winner on a, a development opportunity, perhaps for, for some, is on strategy, the sort of uh, planning and um, uh, openness, willingness to check, revise assumptions as we're engaged in these contexts. Uh, great. Thank you all for, um, for participating. We're going to uh, come back to these results in just a moment here. Um, here's a part of the, the, the webinar today that uh, would love to uh, invite some voices into the room. Uh, and that is, you know, so far we've talked about the business case, uh, the, how the environment has shifted that puts a premium perhaps on these skill sets, uh, and then a, a model, a way of thinking about, you know, what does cultural intelligence look like uh, for those in leadership roles or those in positions of influence, which, which you're all a part of. So now I'd like to invite your perspective on maybe the experience that you reflected on uh, when we began today by uh, adopting more of an appreciative inquiry perspective. And that is rather than think about a challenging experience, a setback with navigating across cultural context, I'd like you to reflect on your own organization, the, the own environment in which you're embedded and, and, and ask you to think about when you think of leaders when they're at their best in your organization, in your context, what do these CQ capabilities or skills look like? What do they look like in actions, in tactics, in behaviors? When leaders are at their best demonstrating any of these, these capabilities, what does it look like? And that's really important because it provides necessary context for all of the organizations that are represented um, uh, in the room today. Um, and then two, you know, if you were to move forward and develop uh, your targeted area uh, uh, on any of these capabilities, what might be some developmental strategies, some tactics, some actions? And it could very well be what you've observed of, of leaders who are particularly skilled in this regard. Um, so process-wise, if I could invite you uh, to do one, one of two things or both. Um, one, I uh, would love to invite some, uh, some voices in the room 
uh, by you know, clicking on the hand raise button. Uh, would love to invite you to share um, who you're thinking about, and you don't have to name anyone. It's more, you know, when, I, when you think of leaders at their best in your organization, this is what culturally intelligent skills, capabilities looks like. These are the actions, these are the tactics. So if you'd like to share, we'd love to hear your voice. And uh, two, uh, if you'd prefer, uh, you're welcome to offer your reflections in the chat and um, uh, we'll, we'll restate those uh, for the webinar uh, as, we, as we move forward here. All right. Great, Kevin, it looks like we do have somebody that would like to speak. Gary, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to talk. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can, Gary, thank you. Um, for many, many years, I worked for a, a large airline company and the airline flew international trips very often and they would assign flight numbers uh, such as flight three, which was going to Tokyo, Japan, for example, from uh, the US, specifically Chicago at that time. And it naturally fell that uh, if you're taking flight three over to Japan, you might just as well take flight four back from Japan to the US. However, this airline did not take into consideration that the number four in the Japanese culture uh, was had a very negative connotation, uh, very similar to death, and which is the reason why when you buy a Japanese tea set, for example, there won't be four pieces, four teacups, there'll be five. The Japanese will go out of their way to avoid the number four. And so obviously uh, doing the research beforehand and finding the meanings in these types of uh, numbers or, or language uh, would have been very beneficial for that airline. And, and in, in the long run, many, many years later, they did finally figure it out and changed the flight number from four to another number. I think that that kind of uh, contributes to this concept here. Absolutely, Gary. Thank you for, uh, for chiming in. A great illustration of CQ knowledge, the sort of how do we arm, prepare, Kind of have some understanding of, in this case, language uh, and the, the cultural uh, valence in, in this case, numbers. Uh, and, and that's a, a, a beautiful example of that. That would be quite helpful uh, to navigate. Thanks for uh, kicking us off, Gary. Um, any other uh, voices? Would love to hear yeah. your, uh, your comments. Kevin, I'm going to invite in Ann Cameron to talk, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you access here. You'll just probably need to unmute. Thank you, Kevin. Can you hear me? We can hear Perfect. you, man. Hi, so much for hosting this and being part of today. Thank you so much. Um, I'm currently an executive MBA uh, in the school presently, um, and my previous organizations have been kind of mid to large scale, uh, cross-functional and global. And so for me, my personal perspective, I think leaders in the organization are at their best uh, when they have a conscious effort, uh, not just, you know, tactically, uh, but strategically focused on people, process and systems. Um, you know, I think it's very rare to find an answer to your number one. Um, <laughs> in my personal experience, I feel like it's very rare to have like a superior leader that can tackle all of these. Um, you know, I think there's always a level of challenge uh, from people. And I think processes tend to break as much as you have them as structured outlines in companies. Um, and sometimes with systems and technology and automation, um, there's a lot of layers to it. So sometimes, you know, getting another platform, another solution isn't always the best problem or solution to the problem, um, as opposed to like, you know, finding a workaround or working through to the root cause. So um, that's just a little bit about my feedback. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect, and I appreciate your comment. Uh, people, process, and systems, the heart of strategic alignment. Uh, uh, wonderful to, to hear you share that. And uh, uh, your point is well taken. The idea, it could just be a, a single practice that uh, you know, creates an environment for more, more culturally conscious decisions to be made. For example, selection systems and ensuring a number of voices are involved in that process is just, just one way to do that. Thank you for, uh, for chiming in. Um, any other um, voices? Anyone else?
Kevin, I'm not seeing anybody else with their okay. hand right now. Um, but let me. Uh, Marley, it looks more. like uh, there's one more person that raised their hand just now. Great. Yeah, we'll get one more and we'll we'll keep moving here. Go right ahead if you're ready, please. Hi, I'm one. If, I'm wondering if that's me, Maria Cervantes. Yes, Maria, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure if this is kind of what you're looking for, but how I'm interpreting it is um, one of the best leaders that I came across with in my past was doing something very simple. She invited us over to her home and she invited just really a diverse, it didn't matter if you were the CEO, it didn't matter if you were the office assistant, like nothing mattered, right? And really she just said, bring a dish to share, a traditional dish to share, because that really just opened conversations to our culture. It also opened the floor to just being genuine and asking um, questions about each other's cultures. And that just built a very strong rapport that any time that, for example, I had a friend who was um, from um, Malaysia and I didn't really understand the culture. But that dinner really opened the door to having confidence and having trust that I can go and ask her anything genuinely that I was interested about her culture. Cool. Thank you, Maria. What a fantastic uh, uh, experience to reflect on and to share with the group, uh, both on inclusivity, the cultural relevance of food, and, and traditions um, and you know creating you know a psychologically safe environment and a personal setting goes a long way you know to 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 other contexts where maybe tough decisions have to be made you have that sort of, of trust uh, thank you for sharing that with the group um, I'm a little bit conscious of time so I'm gonna I'm gonna push us forward a little bit here thank you for those who uh, contributed both in the um, uh, the conversation a moment ago. Um, I did see some fantastic posts uh, from both um, Suzanne and Anna. Uh, Suzanne, thanks for sharing the healthcare context and the, the clinician uh, context specifically in a, you know, a incredibly diverse uh, context in which we are in here in um, Southern California. So thank you for your contributions. Um, I, I do want to spend just a few minutes here on the, the global leadership program itself, just as a way to you know, um, give you a, a, a taste essentially of some of the, de the design assumptions of the program. Um, and then I'm gonna um, uh, transition to uh, some Q&A, give you a chance to ask any questions at all about uh, today. Uh, and we'll close with, um, uh, with Missy around uh, uh, final thoughts. So a little bit on the, the Global Leadership Program. First and foremost, uh, it's designed um, certainly with an, an experiential uh, developmental mindset, meaning uh, it leans heavily on um, uh, role playing exercises, on assessment activities, on essentially the, the transfer of training uh, challenge that all programs have. And that is, you know, how do you embed your learning in the reality of the roles that you're in? Uh, we just had, you know, a, a kind of a sampling of that a moment ago and hearing different contexts. And so using things like comprehensive leadership development planning, um, a validated leadership assessment tool, global leadership assessment tool, uh, a hybrid delivery model uh, in terms of asynchronous and synchronous learning sessions, um, and, and being really thoughtful about learning from one another. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer learning aspect, always important in leadership executive development, uh, but particularly important in this context that the diversity ex of experiences everyone brings to the room is an important part of the program design. And so uh, the four courses here, um, the, the cultural intelligence uh, module is an example of the leading across cultures or leading across cultural context. That's the first course. Uh, we also get into strategic alignment, leading strategy. Uh, so that, uh, in fact, we had a good contribution. I think it was uh, Anne earlier, people, process, and systems, the sort of alignment challenges that, that leaders and professionals have in culturally diverse contexts. So typically multinational global context that brings unique challenges in that regard. Um, we have a course around uh, leading innovation and, and much of this is, is similar to, you know, how, how can, how should leaders cultivate psychologically safe environments where innovation and learning and adaptation can thrive. 
Um, if the assumption is we're operating in highly VUCA context, and for most of us, um, I, I, I would assume for everyone in the room, to some degree, that is the reality, um, then that puts a premium on, you know, how, how do you cultivate environments where innovation can thrive? Uh, and that's particularly challenged in, in very diverse environments. And then finally, uh, leading self. Uh, uh, we, um, COVID, one of the many lessons of the global pandemic um, was, you know, it, we sort of, if we leave uh, the management of, of, of self, personal resources, time, energy, emotional intelligence, uh, work-life balance, and, ever, and other personal resources, um, that comes at a great cost. Uh, and, and that's certainly showing up in a lot of the data and what we're learning. So uh, leading self or self-management, important part of the, the course. Okay, um, just a little bit on the global leadership assessment. Um, this is intended to be a, a good starting point uh, to get a sense of, of, of both where you see yourself along uh, these uh, a series of 20 leadership capabilities. Uh, which we have listed here, um, as well as engage uh, those in your, your professional context. And so the uh, multi-source 360 assessment is a, a part of the design, which allows for very thoughtful development planning. And that is, um, as you go through the program and you're trying to make choices on which of these leadership competencies do I want to further leverage for development because they're a strength, which of these maybe are our blind spots or development areas, you can be really thoughtful by leveraging feedback data. And so that's built into the program. Um, this is just an example of the, the feedback report that you would receive. Um, just as importantly, a, a development plan is really critical to ensure you're translating feedback data into something that is meaningful, that is embedded in the context in which you operate. And so that, that's really tightly uh, coupled in the, in the program. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, thinking of, of today's session, and do we, we do want to open it up for some more general um, Q&A before we, uh, we wrap up for the, the hour. Um, uh, just wanted to re kind of return us to where we started. And that is, um, as you think about the conversation today, some of the examples that, that were shared, um, you know, uh, what might you do? One action you might take to further leverage one of your strengths, and you, you may have many. So for many of you, you mentioned drive. As a, as a particular strength, meaning intrinsic, extrinsic, and self-efficacy to be successful in a cross-cultural context. Um, you know, what's an action or a tactic, something you might do more of to further leverage that uh, this week, this month, uh, in, you know, in the short term? Um, the same for the other side, and that is, you know, if, if there is an area you feel like is important to your further development um, for one reason or another, did you hear something today that you might you might do more of um, because you know you want to make that a, a meaningful part of, of your development? It's a development opportunity. Did you hear something that you can take with you? Um, and then finally, um, you know, I, I think the, the 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 team or the environment part of this is really important. Um, is there is there a single thing you heard today that you might do to think about you know cultivating an environment uh, of greater cultural intelligence? Um, you know, one framing is to say. I want to operate an environment that is less susceptible to implicit unconscious bias. Did you hear something today that you might take with you in that regard? Um, so let, let's do this, everybody. Uh, we did want to reserve some time for, for Q&A. So I'm going to pause there and invite your, uh, your questions. Um, any questions are, are welcome. I'm happy to, to hear from you. And uh, I think Kathy is going to moderate this part of our conversation today. Yes, yeah, so everybody, I put in the chat, if you go ahead and uh, transfer your questions over into the Q&A section you see on the bottom, we can go ahead and uh, open up questions that you have for Kevin uh, before we bring Missy on. Missy is going to come on here uh, very shortly because we are running out of time to uh, just walk through the program format and schedule. But if you want to put a question in the uh, Q&A, please go ahead and do it. Kevin, just uh, in essence of time, how about if you stop sharing uh, for now, and I'll go ahead and allow uh, Missy access to the presentation. And it, while I do that, uh, we do have a question coming from Julian. Uh, he says, great webinar and such relevant topics. Thank you so much, Dr. Groves. And his question is, how do you make thoughtful, inclusive decisions in a layered organization when you don't have a lot of time to implement rational thinking? Yeah, great, great question. Thank you for ever, ever shared that. Uh, and hopefully you all can still hear me. 
Um, that is a tension we actually target in the program. And often it's, it's kind of couched in what do skilled collaborators do best? Um, and, and not just leaders, but anyone who's, who's trying to thoughtfully engage and be more inclusive, collaborative, but recognizing often decisions have to be made very quickly. Um, and so that, that, that is sort of a tension that um, it's almost a recognition if the decision uh, is important, it's high stakes, and it demands collaboration, is probably more to lose by rushing to a decision point than there is uh, pausing. And so one way we tackle that in the program is to think through, there are decisions where being really strong advocate, telling, being a position, the expert in the room, and being more forceful, and there are other decisions that demand collaboration and adopt more of an inquiry orientation. And so that tension of advocate as an expert versus inquiry, wanting to understand others' views, the latter is far more inclusive. So if it's truly a high stakes decision, probably worth all else being equal, a slower, more deliberative process that, that engages others. Um, but um, want to be fair to your question, of course, some of the decisions you might be referencing, you, know, you need an immediate response, right? So there, there's a, that, that's, a, that's a, a very real constraint. Great question. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, we also have another one coming in, which is very interesting. Uh, Demi says she's preparing to go to Peru and consider giving a talk, but has concerns about being culturally relevant. Do you have any recommendations for her? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Demi, when you say giving a talk, let me just understand that. Uh, you, you mean sort of uh, upon arrival, kind of sharing uh, purpose of your of your visit and project. Uh, let me let me make sure I understand. Um, I think that's what you're you're describing. Uh, giving a talk or presentation to your new colleagues in Peru. Is that right? Maybe you can give a thumbs up. So we'll. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll assume that's that's the context. So um, one thing I would share, you know, it's somewhat similar to, to the tension around CQ knowledge and, and CQ strategy is you certainly are arming yourself with culturally relevant context. Uh, what do you know about about the region in Peru, the, the broader regional, um, you know, cultural values and, and norms? And so those are things you can clearly, you know, kind of arm yourself with as you're preparing this talk, this presentation, but the tension becomes how you use those assumptions as sort of loose, uh, malleable expectations, meaning CQ strategy is all about willingness to revise and step away from assumptions, knowing that that, that may not be the right way to, to engage with, with your new colleagues in this context. They may not all engage in the kind of Peruvian way that that you know the kind of knowledge base would would describe. So it's a way to plan for, anticipate, but be willing to be flexible, revise assumptions, um, uh, and that that can be really tough. I know I, I experienced some of that in my own uh, own uh, experience in the you know kind of the Austrian Germanic context for sure. Uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> and Kevin, I'm going to go ahead and give you one more here before we bring Missy in. Um, the question is, what differentiates cultural intelligence and emotional intelligence? Yeah, great, uh, great, great question. In fact, um, I'll, I'll try to be brief here. I, I know we want to we want to close with uh, some important important words from Missy. Um, emotional um, uh, intelligence, uh, by way of the research and validating what is CQ, the biggest distinctions EQ uh, taps into a lot of uh, emotional regulation. And that is the ability to sort of recognize uh, strong, potentially um, uh, disruptive emotions and being able to regulate that in context. Um, so that's, that's the primary distinction. Where it shares uh, areas is around the, the behavioral flexibility. And that is you know, being aware of your emotional triggers, uh, context that elicit really strong emotional reactions and having a plan for it. Um, that, that's a big part of the emotional intelligence um, kind of uh, process and, and perspective, emotional regulation versus adaptability across cultural context. All right, Missy, I'll, I'll hand things over. Apologies for running a little bit late, but I uh, wanna be sure to get your voice in. Thank you all for the fantastic questions. Really appreciate your engagement.
Thank you. And thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon here with us. It's always an honor to have you here and to learn from you, from everything that you know. Um, certainly, this was a very valuable use of my time today. So I appreciate that. So just real quickly before everyone logs off here, I know we're getting at the top of the one o'clock hour, but just want to talk a little bit about the specialized studies program that we offer here at the University and Global Leadership, which Kevin did mention. Um, we are opening this for open enrollment or for consortium cohort based learning model here at the university, um, which is really exciting for us. So we want to make that known and available to you as an individual or for your organizations. Um, it's a four course program that Kevin sort of went over with the four courses that are in the program. Um, considered six units here at the university at 60 hours total of um, learning opportunity. So we're slide forward, Kathy. Um, so program format, Kevin briefly teached or touched on this, but it's, um, it's a hybrid model. So we integrate a 60 minute synchronous Zoom session every week in each of your courses with your facilitator. Um, really gives you an opportunity to get together in real time with your cohorts, learn from one another, and learn the core content for that week. Um, alongside asynchronous learning, which is, you know, reading, discussion questions, um, hands-on experiential learning activities, and um, one of the key features is this learn leadership reflection journal. Um, so it really gives you an opportunity to take in everything that you're learning and apply it to, you know, your own journey. Um, it's a really great tool that we've integrated into this program. Each of the four courses is five weeks in length. Um, we give you a week break in between each class. Uh, so the full program is about five months uh, to complete. So the next slide here Kathy has is just a brief overview of our intended program schedule and cost. Um, so it gives you a high level view of the class dates. So we start about mid-May. We're going to conclude the end of October of this year. Um, so right now registration will be open soon. Um, this webinar happened to coincide with a big launch of a new website here at DCE. So um, as we're working through some, some quirks and some, some issues with that new website launch, um, we will have this web or this program open for a registration here shortly. So if you do have a burning desire to learn more about the topic that was presented here, um, we implore you to enroll in this program. It's going to be a wonderful learning experience with a great group of individuals. Um, if you're interested, you can either email myself or Kathy and just say, hey, I want to know more. Please let me know when registration is open. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. And um, again, Kevin, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. It is really, really uh, always a pleasure to have you with us. Um, and it was really great to hear about your recent experience too um, in Austria. So thank you everybody. Um, thank you, Kathy, as always, and the whole DCE team for making this a successful event this afternoon. Um, it's great to be such a uh, part of such a wonderful team. Thank you all. So I, uh, as always, after our webinars, you will hear from me. And uh, most importantly, you will hear from me with detailed program information because our, our site is almost up and ready to go. We're just migrating today. so. As Missy said, the timing is a, a little odd for the day, but that's okay. Never fear, we will have information out to you. Um, Kevin, let me just check real quick and make sure that there's nothing burning in the chat here. Uh, we're getting a lot of thank yous. Um, Anne is asking if we can share the PowerPoint afterward and that unless anybody has any objectives from our side, I think that that would be absolutely fine with us. And I will send out a recording as well. So thank you all. Um, please reach out if you have any questions, but uh, never fear, we will be back in touch with the information that you need for the program. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, Missy. And thank Thanks, you for joining us today. Bye. Bye-bye.